Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Mark, for a fantastic panel. Uh, OK, uh, you're all waiting for your daily fix of what has President Macron said about NATO today. Uh, and while we've been in this session, we've had a fascinating press conference with President Trump, President Macron. Um, and we've heard him say, our common enemy is Islamic terrorism. Russia is not the threat it was. Times have changed. There is no Warsaw Pact. I can't wait to hear what our next panelists have to say about that, their perspective on this. Um, the next session is going to be about NATO's front lines, from the Baltic to the Black Sea. Many of you will be familiar with the fact that, as has been mentioned this morning, NATO has uh, battle groups uh, in Eastern Europe uh, for the first time in its history. What you may not know is that the Black Sea is also becoming an increasing site of competition. I was lucky enough to spend a week this summer on, um, on the Black Sea on a US destroyer and a Ukrainian frigate as they exercised for exercise sea breeze. And NATO ship numbers in the Black Sea have gone up year on year in the last few years uh, as that has become more of a focus for the alliance. So uh, from all the way uh, in the north to the southeastern flank, um, we're going to have an excellent discussion now. Please welcome Bill Neely from NBC News. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. Uh, good afternoon. Our focus on this in this session is on NATO's front line from the Baltic to the Black Sea. Seventy years ago, the countries you're about to hear from, of course, were part of the Soviet bloc. Four of the five, in fact, were part of the Soviet Union, and NATO's mission was to keep them out of the West. Well, things change. NATO's frontier has moved. Russia feels threatened, or at least it says it does. And these states are on the front line. So how safe do they feel? Does NATO do enough to reassure and to deter? And who scares them more? President Putin, President Trump, President Erdogan. Uh, please welcome our guests for this session, beginning uh, from uh, Ukraine with the Foreign Minister Vadim Pristaiko. <laughs> From Georgia, the Foreign Minister David Zalkaliani. <laughs> From Lithuania, the Defence Minister Raimundas Karoblis. <laughs> From Estonia, the Defence Minister Yuri Luik. And finally, from Romania, the Defence Minister, Nikolai Chuka. Uh, as you settle yourself, gentlemen, I'd actually like to take a, a vote, just a quick poll here from the audience. Could you please raise your hands if you believe the greatest challenge to NATO in 10 years' time will be Russia? Well, that's certainly not unanimous. In fact, that's 50% or less. And just one other, other uh, quick question. Is NATO right now doing enough on its eastern frontier? Please raise your hands if you think it is doing enough. It, can you raise your hands if you think NATO is doing enough on its eastern border? And I think that's very, very few. <laughs> Let's see if these gentlemen can convince you at all or if things change by the end of the session. I would like to start with some brief comments for, uh, from each of you. Uh, I, I am going to keep them brief, if possible. Uh, we'll start no particular order except from north to south. So I'm going to start with Mr. Uh, Yuri Luik uh, from Estonia. What is the big challenge that you face, and is NATO doing enough? Well. To be honest, the, the big challenge is what was pointed out here with the show of hands, which is Russia. I mean, I think Russia has shown with its actions that it is a serious security threat. And the fact that uh, there are troops in Estonia, EFP troops, uh, British and French at the moment, I think are a great testament that NATO is doing a lot in uh, supporting its uh, easternmost uh, members. And when people speak about Russia threats, 
and ask whether it's high or low, I always say that this depends on what we do. If we are serious in our actions, if we are clear and concise in our messaging, then the threat is quite low. But if we are weak, if we are wobbly, then the threat can go up. I think the biggest problem at the moment is not the forward presence of NATO troops. They are there. It's a small presence, but they are there. But what we need is more exercises showing how we bring in additional troops if they are necessary reinforcements if they are necessary, and there have been a huge amount of important exercises. Now just an exercise uh, was finished called Tractable, which was a large British exercise, and next year we are very excited to look forward to an exercise <coughs> Defender uh, 2020, which is a huge US exercise in Europe. So it depends on what we do. Thanks. Mr. Karoglis from, from Lithuania, I, I was in Vilnius in 1990 when Soviet troops attacked your television station during the battle for independence. Do you still fear Russian troops? Is NATO doing enough for you? Uh, it's doing quite, quite a lot indeed. And uh, well, you mentioned 1990, of course, after that we had all in Europe, we had so rosy glasses period when we are looking very optimistically with the Russia and thought that there are chances for Russia, but the war uh, you know, against uh, Georgia in 2008, and in particular <clears throat> after the attempts of, of, of uh, reset of the relations, which was unsuccessful, it was, uh, of course, the aggression against Ukraine, and it's, 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 it's continue. So Russia, unfortunately, is, uh, continues with the threat to, to, to our region to both to Baltic region and then Black Sea, the Black Sea region. And for Lithuania, it's the now, it's the only existential external threat which we have. It's without any, any doubts. If the country do not, does not respect uh, international obligations, if it does not respect sovereignty, independence, territorial of integrity of countries, and also if, it, if its continued actions to disrespect and to continue with influence in its neighborhood, it means that it's a real threat. And I think to, from 2014 it was done quite, quite a lot. And Yuri has mentioned already so this, this EFP uh, need to enhance forward presence. We have the leaders of, of Germany enhancing of the air police, adapt, adaptation of, of NATO structure. So, which is really also very, very important. Uh, the readiness initiative, of course, it's again about uh, the conventional threat, which in our view, first of all, is, is, is Russia. What we need to, to, to have more exercises, definitely. So we're looking to this time US 2030 defender exercises, but of course NATO as, as such is also involved here. And uh, yes, but also other measures which we, which, which we need. So air defense, which we are still lacking, more precise defense planning, and uh, well, other similar measures. But I think uh, Lithuania has never had such number of, of, of guarantees as and, 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 and allies as we have now, and this is really important. So Russia, the only existential threat. Mr. Chuka from uh, Georgia, arguably the Black Sea situation is more complicated, more players we have, for example, Turkey. Uh, do you feel that Russia is the only threat to you? Uh, of course. Uh, no, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity to address this audience and to talk about the uh, top foreign policy priority for Georgia, which is uh, full integration uh, to NATO. And uh, uh, the Georgia is uh, one of the most advanced country, aspirant country. And, uh, it's uh, well recognized for our fact that, that there are all practical tools for which Georgia has, uh, the annual national program, NATO Georgia Council, as well as substantial national uh, NATO Georgia package, uh, which uh, is really very helpful for to, to speed up the process of uh, the actual goal of Georgia, which is a full membership. At the same time, in the, in the region, in the Black Sea region, which is becoming more and more important place of attention to NATO. 
the, the one of the main security challenge comes from uh, Russia. As we speak right now, the process of uh, occupation is going on in Georgia. It's a legal process of borderization, installation, installation of barbed wire fences and artificial barriers across the occupation line. People are kidnapped, they are detained in illegal custody. The normal people are suffering there, and uh, just recently the, uh, the, the, the famous Georgian doctor was kidnapped and sentenced uh, to illegal custody. Unfortunately, for the time being, he's still there, and we are trying to consolidate support of international community. But uh, um, uh, it's uh, what we are facing there is a, uh, uh, the humanitarian disaster. And we, uh, in response to this, we are trying to consolidate support. And uh, <coughs> we believe that uh, the, uh, the Georgia's way towards integration to uh, EU-Atlantic structure is uh, uh, not directed against the third party. It's, uh, it's for, for strengthening our defense capability, for strengthening our resilience. You have mentioned Turkey, which is an important uh, um, um, country in the Black Sea region. It's a literal state, um, uh, also a member of the NATO. And uh, we, have, we are developing very strong strategic partnership with Turkey. So Turkey is a very strong ally to Georgia. So Turkey still continues uh, and will continue to support Georgia's NATO aspiration and Georgia's, uh, uh, supporting Georgia's sovereignty and territorial integrity. So it's in our interest to stabilize the security situation in the region with uh, taking into consideration all legitimate interests of all NATO uh, member states and the, uh, the, the uh, literal states of the, the Black Sea region, because without secure Black Sea, there will be no security in the Euro-Atlantic uh, Euro, uh, security space. L let me bring in Ukraine, because like Georgia, you have faced Russian troops, uh, Crimea annexed. Uh, part of your country uh, invaded. I was in Donbass earlier this year and it didn't seem safe to me. Do you feel safe, reassured in any way by NATO? We have President Trump playing games, it seems, with aid, military aid to your country. I agree with you and you know what I'd like to tell you immediately that by the number of hands which were raised on your question, I came to two conclusions. First of all, too few Ukrainians in the room. <laughs> Second of all, we are failing as Ukraine, as Ukrainian foreign affairs, to explain to the rest of you who are not Ukrainians what is the real threat to all of you. We have 14,000 people dead just because they decided to, to impose their political system, will wish whatever they, they have to. And we are casually discussing what could be the biggest threat in this region. What I see that Yes, the north of Europe, the Baltic states, Poland, now under the focus of the, of the NATO, we can talk about more or less troops. I'm not NATO myself, I, I can give you the recommendation. What I see that we are, the, we are overlooking the uh, re region of Black Sea for many, many years. We believed collectively, we're not, we are not subscribing with NATO, we are not member of NATO, it's our fault, we didn't become, but we believe that this region is safe because of the presence of the NATO, because of the Turkey. Now we have to understand all of us what Turkey is. And here I am on the same page as NATO because this is neighbor. This is somebody who is keeping the keys to the Black Sea where we happen to live. So if we are losing this you know, concentration, because there are so many other priorities, south of Europe, other parts of the globe, we believe that we are left on our own. And this was something which like, we would like to, to avoid. And Reciprocating on your quite provocative question, I have to give you another thing, which Ukrainians sometimes asking uh, Westerners, especially the NATO, telling guys, we actually, whether you like it or not, defending your eastern flank. And sometimes we've been hearing, who ask you for? Why would you do it? We'd never ask you to defend our flank. We are quite capable in defending. So do you believe that Ukrainians so the input is needed, or Ukraine's role is important to NATO as much as we see the NATO is important, at least in our part of the region. And Mr. Chuka, from, from Romania's point of view, Black Sea as well, uh, do, do you feel that the only threat to you might be Russia, or is it a resurgent Turkey and is NATO doing enough for you? You're in, they're not in. Is, from the inside, is NATO doing enough? Uh, so, uh, the Black Sea, it has a very... Uh, geostrategical relevance taking into account that it links Europe, Asia, and Middle East. So, uh, taking into account that since uh, 
2008 and then 2014 since Russia invaded Crimea and created in the Black Sea an outpost from where it is projecting their forces where they are interested for. Um, I do uh, consider that um, 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 the, and the, the Black Sea is, is having a very, very important relevance for all the NATO and European countries. And uh, I think, back to your first question, if NATO is doing enough, um, I will start saying that Russia is looking to the eastern flank as a whole. What we did, we are having two different decisions. We are having EFP in the uh, Baltic and Poland area, and we are having the TFP in the Black Sea region. I am not saying that to compete with the measures taken in, in, in the northern part of the eastern flag. Uh, what I am saying is that NATO and EU needs to have a very coherent approach to the whole flag. To the whole flank. So, um, uh, what what is now happening in, in, in the Black Sea is that uh, we are having three main partners: Ukraine, Georgia, and Republic of Moldova. Um, we are having three NATO riparian countries of the Black Sea: Turkey, Bulgaria, and Romania. So, all our activities are, are planned and conducted together. And um, I can say that taking into account the Romanian initiatives to set up a, a multinational brigade, a multinational division, now multinational core headquarters, all of these are done on our money and with the participation of, of all the NATO countries and very much looking to the partners to be part of that. So, I do really uh, believe that we need to focus on strengthening the NATO and EU presence and also the NATO and EU, EU cooperation in order to support the uh, partnership countries of NATO and the EU as well. So it would appear that President Macron doesn't agree with what the panelists have said because in that famous interview with The Economist he said Russia isn't NATO's biggest threat, that's terrorism. Just, just anyone at all, was that a wise thing to say? Was it, as President Trump said this morning, a dangerous thing to say? Uh, if I may, sir, uh, sorry for yes? uh, 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 involving myself again. Um, I think here in, in the Black Sea region, we should not forget the Balkans. And this morning, somebody was asking if the Balkans, is the Balkan to be considered the soft belly of the alliance? I think if we will not take all the measures to consider the threats coming from east, the threats coming from south as well, because here we have a crossroad, this is going to become the soft belly of the alliance. So this is my personal opinion. So on President Macron's view that terrorism is the key threat to NATO, President Trump saying this morning uh, President Macron's comments were, were dangerous. At least I would, would, would repeat what I told. For Lithuania, the for Lithuania, Russia is the only existential threat, and, and, and really that's it. And I think also for, for full NATO, at least the eastern flank of NATO. And how it's possible to say that, uh, well, we, we can't uh, agree with, with, with this uh, suggestion. Uh, well, in particular, if Russia, of course, uh, its military doctrine says that uh, uh, so the NATO is the adversary of Russia and uh, ex exercising and concentrating its main and most capable military forces. It's, it's impossible to say that Russia is, is not uh, posing threat. Regarding terrorism, yes, it's, it's also another area of, 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 of NATO work, but we also, we are ready and we continue our efforts there. We are, our troops are in Afghanistan, Iraq, and, and, and Mali, and, and elsewhere. So we really need to, to cover all the areas where we see NATO as, as the defense alliance see the, the, the threats. Russia, 
terrorism and of course uh, strategic competition with, with, with China. Minister, was it wise of President Macron to open up yet another divide in NATO by saying this? Well, I agree with my Lithuanian colleague. I think the key is uh, uh, we, we very much appreciate the fact that uh, uh, terrorism is a major threat. Looking from our point of view, it's clear that uh, Russia is the, as my Lithuanian colleague said, existential threat, meaning that it's a nation state which, having enormous military capabilities, can exert enormous damage. So deterring uh, Russia, the only organization which can viably do that is NATO. So if we talk about the role of NATO, then I believe that's very clear. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't fight terrorism. For instance, the biggest Estonian operation now abroad is in Mali. And it is together with the French. It's uh, a military mission called Barkhan. Uh, so nobody should tell us that we are not investing enough to work and, and, and fight against terrorism. And as my Lithuanian colleague also said, most of our operations are actually in the south, uh, fighting uh, terrorism, maintaining stability. So that's, that's what we do. From Ukraine's point of view, you, you know Russia very well. I mean, is, is President Putin laughing as NATO celebrates its 70th anniversary when arguably there are more splits within NATO than we've seen for a very long time? I believe that he is not laughing. He still appreciates and respects the, the mightness of, of the alliance. That's actually the only language which Putin understands. And I have to bring to your attention that sometimes we are missing. We are trying to achieve deal with him, all of us. And in reality, he understands that's only other language. And the second thing is, you know, when you're asking about what is terrorism or Russia, I don't actually feel the difference. Terrorist, by default, is somebody who is exerting violence to achieve some political political something. How can you tell that Russia is not doing the same? Is killing people in Ukraine, is threatening with biological and chemical weapons around the Europe for what? Just to waste some of the resources of chemical, reducing chemical weapons? No. They are trying to achieve some political goals. So this is a terrorism on a very high state level. How worried, yeah, sorry, sorry, yes. So I think by, ident by identifying the threats and challenges, it's not necessary to divide the alliance. But the alliance should, st uh, should stay united, should analyze all those threats and challenges, and to find the instrumentation in order to cope with all, all, all these, uh, these threats. So I, I just left the military committee of NATO, and I remember that all the chiefs of defense uh, or uh, uh, very, uh, very clear that the approach of NATO should be 360 degrees, and we, uh, I do really very much believe in that. N NATO should remain united, but of course Turkey has just invaded an Arab country without consulting any NATO ally except perhaps one which green light of it. I'm, I, I know I'm being provocative here, but honestly, should Turkey be a member of NATO anymore? Do you feel that they are undermining the alliance? Anyone, sir? Yes, uh, of course. Uh, you know, but uh, first, coming back to your previous question, you know, that uh, about the terrorists, whether it's a threat or not, a challenge. Of course, this is a very serious threat and challenge. And uh, what is important to underline that uh, it's, of course, there are 29 members, there are different positions and uh, different uh, evaluation of the current threats and challenges, but it's really important to stay united. The united position, solidarity within NATO partners is really important. You know, as an outsider, but not a member of the NATO, you know, our advice and our wishful thinking for... But I suppose that was my point, that Turkey clearly didn't feel any obligation to stay is, in Turkey is really important player in, in the region. That it's uh, uh, needless to um, uh, say the impo important contribution Turkey is doing uh, for the strengthening of the uh, European security. Uh, of course, there are different uh, positions and different uh, um, assessment of the current situation, but we have to take into consideration the very serious position of Turkey playing in the region for strengthening the uh, security in the Black Sea, in the wider Black Sea region, and also for the EU Atlantic security. Sir, you wanted to come in. 
Yeah, of course, Turkey is an important uh, member of the alliance, and uh, I think if people say, when people say that we should bring more issues to the NAC table and discuss them, then let's also recognize how difficult it is. I mean, for a sovereign country to come to the NAC table and put an issue to be debated by all NATO members. Very few countries actually do it. I would say European big countries don't do it, at least not very often. I mean, the United States is perhaps a very good example that it can be done. For instance, the United States brought to the table the IMF treaty and actually achieved, which is quite unique, a unanimous opinion about US leaving uh, IMF treaty and Russia being to be blamed for the uh, violation of the <coughs> treaty. But as I see Deputy Secretary General of NATO here, as he knows well, uh, people are not necessarily bringing all these issues uh, to the table, and we shouldn't name only Turkey here. And uh, do, do you, I mean, you mentioned the US there. Do, do you have confidence that if President Trump is re-elected, so we have another five years, uh, that he will maintain his more recent stance towards NATO as opposed to his earlier stance when he said NATO was an obsolete organization. Do you have trust in President Trump in four or five years' time, sir? <clears throat> the answer is yes, and it's not only about the personality of President Trump, but also about the administration in general. It's about also U.S. traditions here. And the transatlantic link, transatlantic bond is really strong. And these questions, the first question I, I got when I became a minister was exactly about this, the same as, as, as you, you asked right now. And it's already three and a half years, years ago. And what, what is on the ground? That during this time we have more American troops in Europe. We have on the ground more engagement with uh, partially, quite seriously, with the, the U.S. leadership. We have very important agreement on the NATO adaptation, on the enhanced forward presence in the Baltics and Poland. Now deployment of uh, U.S. troops in Poland, which is of critical importance for us, and also this uh, deployment of the for, for half a year at present, which we have, uh, so the battalion of U.S. troops in Lithuania, and the 23rd uh, defender exercises, which we will have the, among the biggest exercises in the region so after the Cold War. So this demonstrates that full U.S. engagement, its leadership, and uh, we don't have any doubts that it will continue. Minister Prashaiko, do, do, do you feel the same way? I mean, as I said earlier, Mr. Trump <coughs> appears to be playing games with your military aid. Uh, you know, I'm getting back to my favorite topic, Russia. Uh, that's more or less the same, same page, but from different sides. Yes, I agree completely. Uh, President Trump will get to understand NATO more and administration. It's like with the Russia. Each and every administration tried their way. Somebody was looking in trying to find Seoul. Somebody else was pushing big red button to restart the relations. And it's been part of American uh, modern history, uh, polit politi political history, to try to, to reset and to relaunch relations with Russia, which is, was, was and is and will be failing each and every time. And administration will know it, sometimes in a hard way, sometimes they will be much more flexible from the very beginning. And that's not just American, NATO itself. And in Ukraine, look at us, we are were, we were trying. My, my new president is trying to reach out to Putin and understand how we can get the, this war settled and how, how can we get out of the war. That's what all of us were honestly trying. And this will bring us all to, unfortunately, I'm not happy with that, to, to understanding that we have to reinforce alliance and to understand that, unfortunately, Russia is not with, with this us part. Mr. Chuka, I know you had your hand up. And then I'd like to take a couple of questions from the audience, sir. Okay. Uh, sir, I think the first we have to trust on President Trump is the American people. Uh, we trust very much because we are having a very strong uh, strategic uh, uh, partnership with the United States. And uh, as I mentioned, we are having our uh, uh, initiatives, and those are part of the TFP, and the uh, very relevant presence in, uh, within those uh, uh, 
initiatives are the American soldiers. So I can say that in the last period of time, United States has increased uh, the, the presence. We are hosting also the um, uh, um, uh, uh, American uh, air, uh, airfield uh, and air base. So that's also very important for us. And uh, we are very much looking forward on uh, um, developing all these relationships, taking into account the uh, challenges in the Black Sea. To be fair to President Trump, he gets a lot of uh, stick, but he has authorized greater defense contributions uh, in the last few years. Lady here with her hand up, please, a question. Okay. <laughs> Sadiha Chowdhury and I'm a sixth form student um, hoping to study politics and social sciences next year and my question is kind of slightly off tangent but it's in regards to refugees and I kind of wanted to know each of your opinions on how refugees are handled not just in your own countries but, but globally and if you personally think that there's room for this to be improved and if so in what way? So the refugee wave which is can also be a destabilizer. It can be an issue of national security, sir. Easy with me. We have, we have our own almost two million refugees because of the war, mm -hmm. which we have to adapt within Ukraine. We're not sending another wave to Europe. We're doing it right now. So we do understand and feel the pain of the refugees. So we are understanding in solidarity with these people who are trying to find their safe havens, bringing their kids and the rest of the belongings. Same is about Georgia. We have our own refugees, and uh, more than 300,000, almost 400,000. It's almost 10 percent of Georgian population. We have our internally displaced persons, and people are really suffering. You know that we, what we are facing in our occupied regions is a humanitarian disaster. The population is decreasing uh, five, uh, six times, and. Uh, uh, the, the, the we are dealing with the problem. We have our moral and legal obligation toward these people, you know, to alleviate suffering of those who are displaced because of uh, occupation and uh, criminal annexation of these territories. I, I, I'm going to push it on because I think we probably we, we can all agree that the refugee wave from Syria and elsewhere, not least in this country with Brexit, has been a destabilizer. Lady here, yes. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you, ministers, for uh, engaging us in such a fascinating discussion. I'm Elena Poptolorova from the Bulgarian Atlantic Club. Um, and yes, uh, Minister Chuk, I was the one who raised the uh, alarm, so to say, over the Balkans becoming the soft belly uh, of transatlantic security if not measures are taken. Um, actually, I happen to be one of those who think it's about NATO doing too little too late. The Atlantic Club of Bulgaria has long uh, argued the need, the necessity of enhanced NATO presence in the Black Sea. Experts claim that there is a disbalance of six to one uh, superiority for, for Russian uh, maritime presence in, in the Black Sea. So my question to you gentlemen would be, ministers, would be uh, given the restrictions of the Montreux Convention, how do you think we can go about it? Uh, do you think NATO would be prepared for enhanced uh, military um, exercises, presence, rotating presence, if you wish, in order to make sure that we can achieve the goal, being respectful at the same time of realities which we cannot change now? I, okay, I, I will take that one. Um, um, yeah, you're right, the Montreux Convention is limiting in some way the uh, NATO presence in the Black Sea, but I can tell you that in the last two, three years, we were having a NATO presence uh, at least for 160, even 185 days per year. But uh, I do very much trust in all the NATO European countries to develop their own maritime capabilities in order to have uh, the instrumentation to be able to uh, respond by themselves and also to support any NATO presence in the uh, in the Black Sea. I, I gather, Mr. Yeah, Chief, I, you have to leave. Uh, very sorry for that. Here's an important engagement. There was a gentleman at the back there who had his hand up. Yes. 
thank you. My name is Vajotas Benicius. I'm a journalist from uh, Vilnius, Lithuania. Uh, Mr. Karoblis, in his introductory remarks, said that among things that uh, Lithuania needs is more precise defense planning. I would like to ask Lithuanian and Estonian ministers whether you believe that uh, you would find solution with Turkey during this leaders' meeting uh, to get approved, updated NATO defense plans for Baltics and for Poland, and why they are important for the security. Thank you. And I would add to that, do you feel that you're being taken hostage by Turkey, that they're blackmailing NATO? Well, I would not uh, say that it's about uh, blaming <laughs> that. Yeah, this is one of, first of all, we have defense plans. And it's the, the revision of that, of course, to, to, to have more precision and similar aspects and to have the adjustment. And it's one of the, only one of the topics we, we have in NATO. And, and, we, 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 and of course, uh, so among others. And uh, really, it's so how the life is, is, is continue. And regarding the results, we'll see. So the, the, the meeting, the summit, the leaders' meeting will start now. But um, uh, earlier or later, during this meeting or, or, or later, of course, we will, we will find the, 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 the solutions. We see the, the, the progress. And it's one of the issues. So NATO is, is the alliance, alliance of 29 countries. Naturally, the, the positions from time to time, they, they differ. And the beauty of the alliance is that we are finding the solutions. And I, I am sure that also we will find the solution earlier or later on this issue too. Mr. Lewick, I think the question was for you as well. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, uh, the discussions are going on all the time. Obviously, there are opportunities during the summit, uh, attempts to find a compromise. If we don't find a compromise here, we hopefully will find it uh, a bit later, but I'm absolutely sure that we find a compromise. I have no doubt about that. But it's very important to understand that Baltic states have defense plans, defense plans related to Article 5. So it's not that we are lacking defense plans as such. Uh, I'm also a bit sad that the issue of defense plans, which according to NATO's uh, usual procedure are not to be discussed openly uh, at all, have become a major s subject of discussion all, all around the world. But that's how, that's how the mod modern world works. Just a very brief question to Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, you were promised membership. I mean, it was more than that. You were approved, if you like, more than 10 years ago, uh, and, and still you're waiting outside the door. I mean, do, do, do you feel frustrated? Do you feel, are you beginning to feel that you could be betrayed by NATO? Mr. Zalkan? Yeah, you are absolutely right. The decision uh, made in, uh, during the Bucharest uh, summit in, back in 2008 was more than 10 years ago. And uh, this is the decision where uh, clearly describes that Georgia will become the NATO member. Uh, since then, there were a lot of summit meetings and also with the different decisions and declarations that Georgia will become a NATO member. Uh, of course, uh, the, we realize that the current situation within the NATO, that uh, there is uh, no political decision made yet, but we are fully using all the existing practical tools, as I have mentioned, the implementation of annual national program as well, NATO-Georgia Council, the substantial NATO-Georgia package, which is also important practical way to speed up the process of Georgia's full integration, moving Georgia closer to the eventual membership. So these are the very important instruments. At the same time, Georgia is already acting like an ally. So we are in the same line as uh, the, the NATO standards, uh, the, for example, on burden sharing. 2% we are spending on GDP, 20% on major military acquisition. Georgia is the biggest per capita uh, contributor to the resolute support mission in Afghanistan. Although we have suffered casualties, 32 Georgians died in Afghanistan for a small country like Georgia. It's quite a big loss, but we realize that this is our contribution to the global security. Of course, when this is not reciprocated, when a country like Georgia delivers, it has to be reciprocated. We need a practical political solution. But uh, 
uh, we are not discouraged by this fact. We are continuing our vigorous efforts. We are working bilaterally with all the uh, members of the alliance, so with the strategic partner, with the uh, United States, with Turkey, with France, with Germany, to increase our defense uh, and security capabilities in order to increase our resilience. So we are doing everything possible to prepare country for the momentum. When this momentum is uh, when, uh, when momentum to, to come, we have to be ready for this. Moment. And, and very briefly, from Kiev's point of view, if you're not in NATO in 10 years' time, what, what would that say? What would you do? Thanks to my Georgian friends, I had the time to you know to gather all my diplomatic <laughs> 20 plus years to describe in diplomatic terms what happened in, in Bucharest, I believe, is a great mistake. That we were not allowed, first of all, we were promised to be a member of NATO. Then it was an idea that membership action plan for Ukraine and Georgia is resolved, and by the end of the year, ministers of foreign affairs had to report to, me, to their uh, respective leaders to tell how it's, it's working. It's been more than 10 years, and we are not invited neither to MAP nor to membership. So I believe the indecisiveness of NATO at that time and since then allowed Russia first to invade Georgia and then in six years to come to Ukraine. Uh, just before we finish, just another question to the audience, because one thing we haven't talked about is China. I'm afraid that is uh, a, a, another subject. But should NATO, just a show of hands again, in 10 years' time, should NATO's focus be as much on China and the challenge from China as it is on Russia. Raise your hands if you think China is equally important for NATO in 10 years' time. Well, that's the biggest show of hands so far, and maybe we should pause or maybe end there. Maybe we've just got time, literally 10 seconds. What would your message be to NATO? Really short, snappy. What would your message be to NATO for the next 10 years, priorities? China. Change. China. China. <coughs> Sir. Georgia. Please keep Georgia. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think that Russia will continue. Still, the mid-term mid threat will be Russia. But China, yes, will be second, and, and the challenges with China will increase. Sir, you get the last word. NATO is a unique organization. A unique organization. No NATO country has ever been attacked by a nation state. This is my me measure of real success. Let's keep NATO alive because it is a framework. It's like a constitution of a country. I mean, there might be those politicians and these politicians, but nobody says, let's cancel the constitution because one or the other politician you don't like. NATO is the constitution of the European security. I think that's the basic message I would deliver. So much we, we haven't talked about China, uh, the cyber threat, climate change, should NATO look east, should it look up to space, but I think we have covered some of the present problems. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together. Thank you.